Uh, it's a real pleasure to see, uh, among all other things, my friends here sitting in the front <laughs> row, and my sister. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm really grateful for this invitation. Enrique had always wanted to come to the UDK because it had quite a story for me and a fame um, uh, with the art school. And now I realize the architecture school is equally important with these friends and teachers here. And this school can really do a great thing. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing and uh, seeing more with the school. But I guess let me begin maybe with a, with a small quote. I'm gonna do a, a four part uh, lecture. We will jump a little bit through. There's no plan as you'll see, um, but I will touch upon provocations, number one. Provocations to make you guys think about architecture and the limits and the boundaries of it. Two, I'll do some very early work which we never show. So that will be interesting. It's gonna be a little sketchy, but it'll be very interesting. And then I'll do more recent, uh, uh, sorry, research work that we're doing, and then finally teaching. So um, we'll jump in between those categories in different moments. But let's begin with the idea that Americans have been watching protests against oppressive regimes that concentrate massive wealth in the hands of an elite few. Yet in our own democracy, when I say my, our own democracy, I mean actually Europe. One percent of the people take in nearly a quarter of the nation's income, an inequality even the wealthy will come to regret. All growth in recent decades and no more has gone to the bottom then has gone to the top. While many of the old centers in Latin America, such as Brazil, have been striving in recent years, rather successfully, to improve the plight of the poor and reduce the gaps in income uh, that America has allowed to widen. Europe, however, is doing a lot better than America. And this is actually a quote by Joseph Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist. So it's uh, revealing that he himself uh, is saying this in his own country. But that's why I take you to this first slide to tell you that there are some things changing in the United States that I think is fundamental which the Clinton Global Initiative. So I took the title from our collaboration there at the Clinton Global Initiative, Designing for Impact. Clinton has actually realized with his incredible uh, power that he has now today that there's an incredible amount of designers around the world that can really help get businesses in different uh, developing world countries. It's actually designers that can be the catalyst to bring to market and to bring you know, different products that are absolutely necessary for Africa, for Latin America, for Asia, um, and can really make a substantial change. But I say this because work is getting hard, as you all know. And if you realize that policy all those boring guys sitting in bureaucratic policy positions, whether it be in, the, in, in Germany or whether it be in Switzerland or whether it be in America, um, at the World Bank or the ID, um, IDB, you can actually really help them and enhance what they're trying to do because they don't know how to implement, but designers can be the glue. So the idea is how can we knit together uh, people together? So let's say NGOs on one a corner, on the other corner, universities, on the other corner, the actual professional individual architect, and on the other corner, the corporations. Corporations also now feel the pressure um, to really try and solve the, what's happening, dramatic reality that's happening in the world. And what we call this political equator, or the sur global, we've coined it many times, is, um, is shown on this map, this pixelated orange map, where most of the world's growth will be in the south, in the sur global, in cities, and it will mostly be in slums. This is an incredible reality and something you guys might want to think about. It's not that we're going to uh, try and propose a kind of top-down landing in these areas, poverty-stricken areas, and, uh, and think that we can really change things. You have to work on the ground. But 
At the same time, how many of you know this film, Los Olvidados, by Buñuel, done in, in uh, Mexico City? This is an incredible film because it's not a documentary. It actually works off a, a real script that was based on newspaper clippings. But I suggest you all see it because Los Olvidados is an astonishing work of art that actually ha makes a huge reflection upon reality, on, on, on what he was witnessing in Mexico at that very time. So these are the provocations that I'm beginning to tell you. Number one, there is no plan. There is no master plan. Cities have grown much too big in the global south, and there's no way to control those cities. Sao Paulo, Mumbai, forget it. So therefore, there's incredible room to move. Because if no one can control, you can find community groups, areas, sites that are underutilized, and you can propose all kinds of things. Today on the International Herald Tribune, I just saw this, the jobless curse of Europe's young. That's a real problem. All of you now studying here and getting out into the world, I tell you, the best thing you can do, and I'll bring an example, is be an export. Go somewhere else to work. Don't stay in your own city, but actually go down south, and you can really make a change. I think the best Europeans, the exported European. My partner, Hubert, is actually one of those exported Europeans who came to Caracas and really made a powerful change in that city. But I'm going to tell you about Otto uh, Kunisberger, which, of course, you must know. A little bit of history is not bad. Who was born here in, in Berlin, and he was trained at the TU, and he became, under Minister Nehru, in 1948, the head of housing in India. Maybe some of you don't know that. And when he returned from India, he founded the, um, the development, uh, Department of Development and Planning at the University College in London and later, later at the AA. But here you see Konisberger there next to Nehru. And he had a huge impact on India, on creating a factory to build houses. Because the great challenge, and that's why I throw it in today, the great challenge of the 21st century is housing. We can't build it fast enough, and we can't build it cheap enough. So uh, if you guys can all work on that, that's fantastic. So, so how do we make sustainable communities? What you see here is not a picture of Caracas, but it seems that Caracas is everywhere. That's what I've began to discover as I move across the world. You see Trinidad here. This is uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad. What's on the bottom is the organized uh, formal city, old, old uh, Port of Spain. And what you see on the top are the hillsides communities completely informal. It's two cities that are divided by this highway. Now, some of you might know some of our pictures from Caracas. You will see the same thing. But what we did and is to create a, an alliance, an MOU, with the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. And we're now assisting real economists on how to implement acupuncture solutions of infrastructure with the community. Here you see the, the map, and it's very clear. You see on the left, you see the formal city where the carnival is, the famous Port of Spinaga, and on the right, you see the informal city. So what we have is an environmental crisis. We really have to figure out how you situate yourself in your time. It's a last round uh, battle. You're in the 16th round, and if we want to change something, we've got to change it now in our lifetime. The most important thing when I was born was the image of the blue moon. But now that moon is one urbanized planet of in incredible uh, mega cities, which, as we said before, are impossible to organize. So how do you do it? There's no master plan possible. So the only way to do it is through smaller interventions. Let me see. OK. So the house is often cited as the metaphor for the city, and the city as a metaphor for the entire planet. We believe that the identification of simplicity within the complex urban form has led us at the beginning of the 21st century to develop the concept of an urban planet. The idea embodied in this concept is that of a modern macropolis, or one globally connected city. If we accept the idea that we are in a unified urban planet, then we can reassess development on the basis of our built city ecology. 
When I came across this map, this is a map at the IDB, Inter-American Development uh, Bank. These are all the projects that are planned for Latin America and financed by the bank. Highways, dams, um, bridges, uh, ports, you, you name it. They're there, and they were in the works with no architect participating. We finally now have created um, a, a sustainable cities unit within the bank, and we've sent someone from our assistant chair to the bank to internalize and find out how these projects are getting uh, executed. But let's take a flight down there. And as we approach down Latin America, South America, we are approaching Buenos Aires. What do we see? We see we've crossed over rivers. Then we see mining. These are the leftovers of some mines all around. You see suddenly urbanization appearing between nature, uh, between agricultural land and city. More sprawl, city sprawl, agriculture and city. And it continues. And actually, I imagine that if we were to freeze this where it is now and no more agricultural land were eaten up, you, would, you could have a kind of 21st century broadacre city, which was a kind of agro-urban combination, Frank Lloyd Wright thought of, um, with the one acre plots. But I think that, that there's still a chance. Not only Buenos Aires and the outskirts of Buenos Aires look like this and agricultural land is getting eaten up, but actually China, as you well know, that's what's happening. Vietnam, that's what's happening. So I think now we have to really think how to freeze the remaining agricultural land and figure out a way in which you can live between urbanization and agriculture. And here you see, as it approximates a city and the highway, what happens. So we have, we're living now through a cultural crisis. And I start here because I think it's a good place to, to start. This is London Olympics. Can you imagine that 10 billion uh, pounds were put into that site? 10 billion pounds. What did, I mean, it was a great Olympics. We know the TV ratings were fantastic. But what did they really get? Well, they got a park now. They're going to dismantle some of the buildings. And, uh, and they've got supposedly a nice urban park for the area. But how do you really see it? Did they really get what they said, a legacy project? Um, and I'll take you through that. This is the neighborhood. And you can see in the sign, the London Olympic site. This is Hackney Wick, which is the border site to the Olympics. This is the last gap. These are posters of people and artists who are living in the Hackney. Um, you might know some of Tracy Ammon, et cetera, are all living in this and near to this area. And if you see on this map, Hackney, let me see if I can, uh, if I can oh, draw your attention to it, yeah? That's, that's the area where the London Olympics was. You see it's the broken of the, of the urban grid. It's kind of an uh, open land. It was industrial site. And there was a little river, the Lee River, there, as you see here. But did you guys know that Cedric Price's fun house was actually situated there in Hackney, on, just on the border of the Lee River? So my question is, how did Hackney benefit from that whole Olympic thing? Actually, they didn't benefit at all. They've got the developers have their sites now on that neighborhood to tear down and redevelop. And, and I think it would be ideal to build the fun house there in Hackney. I think that would be a fantastic uh, idea to actually realize Cedric Pite's fun house. This is the neighborhood. It's full of artists who are going to be evicted slowly. And actually, very good housing stock. Here you see uh, you know, young uh, bankers, because it's not too far from Canary Wharf, living in lofts here. And there you, I found the Fun Time Club in here. So I thought it would be ideal to do a revival of Cedric Price. So as I said, these are provocations. Political, where the formal and the informal meet. 
In 2003, we gave a conference in Caracas, the first conference that was on informality. What is informality? Very vague term. Um, very, you know, it, it, people think that formal and informal are actually opposites. They're not opposites at all. Informal is actually an anomaly. It's information. It's not the opposite of formal. That's why we like it so much. It's actually hard to define. And it gave us a range of interpretation. Um, this is a historic moment for us. This is a conference 2001, the first time we came to speak in an international conference. Um, and it, this conference changed our lives um, by being witnessing the Twin Towers architecture being hit. We were in the conference, and the towers were being uh, 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 blown up. And later, Berlin became very important to us. After that, we were able to show at the IATIS Gallery. This was a huge breakthrough. I would say this was our Iggy Pop moment when Iggy and David Bowie were in Berlin. Um, so, and they were able to put together some good records. Well, Hubert and I, actually, our Berlin years turned into a fruitful moment where in Kassel we showed the 23rd of January um, and we did a number of exhibitions all around. But the idea here is how we can take that line of let's say the Berlin Wall where it was or maybe it's the wall between Gaza, the Gaza Strip and how can we expand it. This here is the Tijuana border between the richest part of the United States, San Diego, and the poorest part of Mexico, Tijuana. And our idea here was to expand this line and create a free trade zone with an, with an airport and a hospital that both Tijuana could use and, uh, and uh, San Diego could use. But that wall, or the expansion of that wall, also became a definitive uh, moment for us in the Venice Biennale. And here, bridging those boundaries, you see two unlikely figures talking, uh, Peter Eisenman and Joseph Riquert. You know, Peter has nothing to do with what we're doing today, but there he was discussing architecture and what he saw. So conflict as a creative tool. The idea that you guys can provoke and create some conflicts. Don't be scared about it. It's not about comfortable. This is how I grew up. So the point is, how were we, after I got back from 1986 from Columbia University, how were we going to form an architectural office in Venezuela? We had been trained to do the most sophisticated buildings you can imagine. Um, and we found ourselves with successive devaluations. We found ourselves with two coup d'etats. We found interim presidents. What kind of a professional attitude were we going to take? And at the same time, we saw all around the hillsides, Caracas completely sprawling with poverty around the hills. Not to say that Caracas is poor, no, because it has the oil wealth, but the oil wealth was not prepared to, uh, uh, for the amount of people that came to the city. So we raised a few eyebrows, and in 2001, we started the Manifesto No. This probably is, the, is what uh, gained a little bit of our conflict in our own country. And it says something like this. We did not come here to, find, to lead courses of diplomacy. We did not come here to acquire a culture with uh, comfortable personal uh, uh, reasons. We came to confront ourselves with the urban problems. We came to call things by their name. We cannot maintain ourselves indifferent in front of the climate, false climate, that constitutes the reality of cultural Venezuela. We came here to, to contribute by attacking the defects and making it fall upon those who have the real uh, 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 reason. Uh, we've become the first victims of this lamentable state of the city, and we reveal ourselves against them, and we talk high in a high voice because it's necessary. We go against everything that we think is regressive, 
and it goes on. We go against everything that has a false function, and it goes on to say we even went against the gremium of architects in our own country. And this obviously raised an eyebrow. We threw t-shirts out on the, on the market at that moment with this manifesto, and the students followed us, but our, our uh, colleagues didn't follow us too well. So we began with very small projects. We were not getting too many clients. Um, and we began to work with the community. And this is the community of La Vega. These are some early drawings of a dry toilet. Um, the idea that we could bring a, a rural toilet into an urban setting. But let me take you through why we thought about this as drawings of that time, too. Let's go through the ecology of a, of a cup of tea. You first. Uh, transport chemicals to agricultural land. You need oil to produce those chemicals in the industry. You need to package the tea. You need to deforest the trees. You need water. You need to treat that water because all the tap water in Venezuela in Caracas is polluted. You cannot drink from it. You need to treat it. You need electrical generation. Then the tea bag, of course, gets wrapped in plastic. It gets put in a box. And then you drink it. And then the, your urine, of course, needs to be separated and, uh, and, and, um, and part of the plastics go to a film. That's the ecology of a tea bag. So we thought, what can we do? So we went up into the most rural areas of that hillside community, and we began to create these modules, of which we built three, and it got approved actually by the Ministry of uh, Environment. And what it has is a little shower. It has a water tank in the back, collects the rainwater. And, uh, and the dry toilet here, you see Eliat Esakov. Um, and we worked here with two artists, with Liat and, uh, and Mariatika Potrik, you might know. And we took Mariatika from New York in a, in, a, in a gallery. She was showing some of her works. She had never been in a slum. We said, don't build them in a gallery, build them in the real. And what do I say to this? I say, like Teddy Cruz, my good friend, says, let's take the urinal, Duchamp's urinal, back off the museum wall and back into the, the real world, right? We need bathrooms. People in Caracas have two cell phones and no toilet. So with that, that collaboration with artists progressed. We began to do murals in the basement of the, of the metro stop. Here we did a mural on 23rd of January, which I'll get to later, which is the largest housing estate I'd ever done in Latin America uh, for 50,000 units. Um, we went in, in the, to Palais Tokyo with Maritika again to make a kind of a growing house prototype. And we did more exhibitions with her also in the dry toilet, of course. And we worked with a Brazilian photographer, Andres Cipriano, who documented the city over time. The same building uh, with five years difference. And what, we, what you notice is the incremental um, finishing off of a building. So that got us speculating on how we could have micro loans like Mohammed Yunus um, and bring that into the urban environment. Why can't people build half a bathroom or get a loan for a window? etc. The banking industry doesn't have that. So you, many of you know this. This is the uh, a fantastic image of the Domino House, Le Corbusier, but what you don't know is it was built as refugee housing in 1917, a post-World War I, and he drew it this way because it was drawn precisely without walls, because it was to be finished off with the cheapest available material or the rubble from the First World War. So here you have, again, now the frame of this idea of the growing house that we saw going up in Caracas every Every day in the slums of Caracas. Basically, the concrete frame has become the, the metaphor for mod modern architecture in Latin America. So here we thought, well, what if we extend this frame up and we have people build out the units themselves? Maybe we could liberate some land. And this was, was the first probe into the vertical favela idea. But I'll take you here on a little anthropological study of Horacio Genaro. He's the first settler of one of the slums called Petare. Um, we met him, fortunately, before he died. And he had a huge archive of pictures. These are his pictures of how they began to settle the land, or this growing house, this growing city ideal. They bank. They create lots. They actually, uh, for family members, you see the, the hand-drawn drawings of how they actually settled the land, municipal land, 
government land, or and sometimes even private land. And they build the first shack. Then over time, 25 years, the whole hill becomes an absolute, uh, let's say an Italian hill town in quotation marks, if you want. But now back to 23rd of January, which is another interesting example. 48 housing blocks, mega blocks, but there was something missing. This was Corbus Tabula Rasa ideal. You cut the land, you bank it, you put in roads. It, it was based on the car city. Um, however, it was missing all the small shops and necessities that, that uh, urban life needs until it was retrofit with all of these small units of uh, favela into all the green space, like a plug-in city, let's say Archigram in Latin America. Um, and what you see here in orange is all of the plug-in informal uh, that pl gets plugged into the formal infrastructure. What we find so interesting with this example is that we believe there's something to this formal, informal combination, this hybrid combination. Um, could, obviously, we cannot eliminate formal. We need infrastructure. We need to plan certain elements in the cities. But we could maybe leave room for some informal growth over time. So we simulated that. And you see first the shack. Um, and then they, they build uh, the columns in the floor slabs. The walls, once that's ready, um, they can leave the shack or they get rid of it and they move up to the second floor and the first floor becomes actually a unit for young school children or a food station or a shop, etc. And then the roof garden actually becomes a place of vegetables, of herbs, uh, medicinal herbs, or it, could, it also becomes for orchids and a little economy. So this is the prototype of the growing house. But we evolved and we had the opportunity after the 99 mudslides to realize this idea of the growing house. Here you see kind of an image. Um, we, the Anglican church of Caracas, the bishop actually of, of the Caribbean, um, had this church and he had his parish house. And we said, let's make some refuge, let's let some emergency housing that would work as this growing house. So here you see the parish, the church, and here's the parish house. So we did a couple of things. We actually did some parking, we opened some holes, we, um, and then we planned for this building to grow over time as housing. Here you see actually the parish uh, house where the, where the, where the, where the, um, the, the priest lived, and then the structure of concrete all around, and here it gets filled up uh, over time slowly, and here you see the, the structure more finished, and to protect the, uh, the outside, we did make this uh, transparent wall. And the floor slab between those concrete structures is steel beams so that people can connect between floors and leave it completely flexible. These were the units we planned, and that, these are very, very early works. Let me just go back. But we found this interesting, which is the 23rd of January blocks. And we thought infill box between, and we thought, can we make a series of units that could actually plug together and assemble and become one of these long, uh, let's say, housing blocks? So the radical, radicalizing of the local, this idea that we could bring informality into the city. So this uh, was the orphanage we did for the Don Bosco Church. If, if you notice, our clients are churches and, and uh, very small communities. So under a highway pass, one, one Sunday we were there with a little umbrella in Petare, a huge hillside community, and, the, and where it meets the highway. And Hubert and I were doing what we call informal vendors architecture, uh, Arquitecto Buonero. And we were offering services, and the uh, local Don Bosco priest came to us and said, can you build an orphanage for us? And we said, sure, let's just build it under the bridge. And he said, are you crazy? We said, look, everyone else is building under the bridge. Just take some land. And he said, well, not a bad idea. So we came back. We, drew, well, we made the drawings, but we came back one year later. And with our drawings, they had executed the, the orphanage with a little playing field on the roof of the orphanage. And the, here, they used all recycled materials that they could find, donations. And under the highway, they built 
Uh, and we then, Jose Antonio Nunez from my office, established a work work, woodworking shop, and we taught the kids how to make chairs and things. So uh, we actually began as an NGO. And the NGO later evolved into what is today Urban Think Tank as a, as a company, but we still keep the NGO for research. We argue that the, that the interaction people have with the built environment constructs a culture of communal behavior patterns within a neighbor, neighborhood. Urban ethnographies are therefore largely shaped by infrastructure. As discussed, there are two processes in which this shaping occurs. The creation of geographic isolation of concentrated poverty and the popula population that intensifies at risk conditions, and the production of public spaces that become hubs of community violence if they're not taken care of. Thus, by using urban acupuncture and sticking purpose-oriented infrastructures, you can help unravel this situation. What we call today's social design, youth-based design. So here are some books that, uh, that we've worked on, um, uh, uh, different things that I'll get to, some of them in this idea of the part two, building the common ground. So I don't know if any of you have read this book, Arrival City. It's fantastic. I really recommend it. Um, it tells you the story of, of, uh, of immigrants coming to, migrants coming to the city in India. And Hubert and I uh, really were affected by this situation, no housing policy, and we began to think, so what's architecture really about? We know architecture is the answer, but what's the question we're trying to solve? So we thought a lot about it, it's the people. It's really about people. And so we began to make with some artists these, these images of just people coming to the city and architectures in the background. So we're really making architecture to somehow solve this density problem. So I take you, anyone who hasn't been to India, I suggest it's a required to a trip uh, because this is Howard Bridge in Calcutta and you've never seen such density and such poverty in your lives. That'll shake you up um, to make you really think about how architecture uh, is really insignificant to, to the lives of people. So these became our first clients. These are some people from Cota 905, from uh, Barrio La Cruz. Um, and here you see the first events we had, which was a basketball tournament with our NGO. And I'm very sad to say, and I have someone who can testify, Marcus Nair, who filmed with us this summer here. Not one of those kids in this picture is alive today. Sorry about that. That last image of that hill is what I wanted to show you. You've never seen something so amazing as Petare. 800,000 people living and have created what is not uh, uh, um, 800,000 houses on a hill, but actually uh, one house the size of a mountain. That's a pretty amazing thing. So we began to make these maps. These are the only maps that exist in Caracas um, that actually map the density of the slums. If you don't fly over the city, you do not realize how dense they are. So we needed detours. So we started this idea of expanding horizons of which you probably saw in Venice, we called the Gran Horizonte or that expanding horizon. And we did this in order to debunk the myths of marginality. Informal settlements are not the problem anymore, but their solution. They are not, no longer defined by illegality. They're actually de facto legal. They can no longer be defined by lack of urban services. They actually have services now retrofit in. They can no longer be defined according to precarious construction materials because they're mostly concrete now and block. They can't even define as free places to live. There's a huge economy going on inside. And finally, not everyone that lives there is poor. So 
I take these, these three little figurines, which I love, the sleepy Mexican, the mariachi, and the, the wrestler. And um, these are kind of lucky charms, right? Um, and we want to debunk the myth of what a Latino architect could be. And here we have kind of Ricky, uh, Ricky Burdett looking at the redeemers. You have Che Guevara, Zapata, Chavez, Fidel, Allende, and Jose Marti. Um, Ricky Burdett, we took him down to Caracas. We took him into the slums. And um, when he was walking around in Cota 905, uh, the, our guide took out a gun and started shooting in the air. And he thought that Ricky would like that, you know, some kind of a show. And Ricky was terrified by it, of course. And then we ended the tour. Ricky said, let's get out of here. And then the guy went up to him and said, some money. You know, asked him for some money. He says, why, why does he want money? Or give him money? He says, give him some money. And, and the reason he wanted money was the bullets that he wasted in the air, he needed to buy more. So I only tell you that because this is an incredible quote by Jeffrey Canada. Those of you who don't know Jeffrey Canada, he's probably the most important um, guy who's reversed uh, the poverty in Harlem. Um, he's, he's, and he wrote this book, Fist, Stick, Knife, and Gun. And what that means is young, young kids begin with their fists, then they move to the stick, then they move to a knife, and then they move to a gun. Um, and he says, when I was first found out that Superman wasn't real, I was about eight. I was talking to my mother who declared, no, no, there's no Superman. I started crying because I really thought Superman was coming to rescue us from chaos, the violence, and the danger. And no hero was coming. So this is not exactly the idea of Superman, but I do believe that all of us have the potential to revive the idea of not the star architect, don't get me wrong, not the heroic figure of Howard Rourke, but actually go on the street and make a difference. You know, here I show you Al Pacino. He's the other image of a Latino in Scarface, right? Only to say, yes, sometimes you have to get bad. You have to, you have to somehow turn into a, a, a Mexican wrestler with a Swiss flag, right? And maybe that's what we become. We become this hybrid. We're super interested in this hybridity. And we, we sometimes perform to create some kind of break. And that performance, lately masks, have symbolized resistance and the defense of people's rights. I'm referring to the masks of V for Vendetta, Indignados, Anonymous, and obviously Pussy Riot. Here the mask is neither associated with the performances of the Comedia del Arte, nor reflecting the emblematic scenes of Eyes Wide Shut, nor the self-parody of being John Malkovich. The mask is rather employed to refer a specific political hero, either figurative or non-figurative, which is recognized by everyone that has an undeniable meaning. So somehow the architect has lost that, the, the, uh, his engagement with society. He's lost that political ideology with which early architecture began from the Russian constructivist to De Stiel to early uh, Le Corbusier. They had a kind of a social uh, a means uh, to, to their work. And I think we can get it back. And I'm going to show you um, a very, very um, rough sketch of something we're working on that really is one of my most enthusiastic projects. It's called Empower Solar Shack. It's trying to bring social empowerment and finance to um, a community, a township in South Africa. Um, this is Cape Town. And we are actually trying to put solar panels on each one of the shacks and actually use them as a solar field. The idea is that, that you would rent the roof of the shack, the shack would take care of the panel, the, and you would have an incredible solar field that would be rented by, by a company, a solar company, and they wouldn't have to rent the land. And at the same time, you could retrofit um, the, the shacks, right? So you could have domestic lighting inside, you can have community lighting, the shacks must be temporary, they must be fire resistant, they must be adaptable, and the shacks must be erected by their users. This is not an idea that we come and we, and we, uh, and we, we bring things in, no. They have to be self-built to empower the community. So we began to work on these shacks, very small ideas of how we could better and not have tin, but actually be some kind of concrete uh, cement board. 
that could be then infilled with structural corners that could be built as a kit. They, would be, they could still be called provisional. And together, um, we're working now and, and proposing that we can work with, the, with some of the things that Olafur Ellison is working with, um, with the light project that he's doing, and bring to the grid uh, solar energy and give back to the grid. So this is just a little rendering of how that's starting uh, to appear to the community. We're still working on it uh, in the local governance. But let me show you a little film of why this is important. So by bringing this, uh, this idea of uh, empowering the community to build their own houses, what are you actually doing? You're actually creating a stronger community. And when they try to get evicted or when the government wants to evict them, they actually are closer knit together. It's what we call blocking out. By slightly moving the houses, you can create courtyards. You can actually create little streets for fire, for other reasons, for servicing. You can actually introduce some bathroom units. Um, and you can, and you, by knitting a group of, of houses together and blocking them out, what is called, you're actually empowering them as a voice, as a communal voice together. This is what's important. This is the new role of the architecture that we're seeking, is that we become glue between top-down efforts and bottom-up initiatives, and we can actually um, make a difference. Because if you see here, all of this needs to be attended. This is La Vega. This is just a uh, little part of Caracas on the side outskirts of Caracas. So it's not learning from Las Vegas, which unfortunately China bought the wrong book. It's learning from La Vega is what we have to uh, look into. But it's also about thinking big and thinking small. So we began doing, selling t-shirts. That's how the NGO began. A few friends got together. Here you see the No Manifesto and a very young Hubert at that time. And we came up with a fantastic book, uh, uh, which we co-edited together with Christine Freires, who's here tonight. And uh, those of you who don't know her, get to know her. <laughs> <laughs> and we worked on several exhibitions where we showed the vertical gymnasium, which I will uh, get to in a second, which wants to be, we don't want to make architecture that's custom made, that's, that's only designed for one off for a one-off project, but we actually think this is the time, this is the decade that we have to actually make project products that go open source. Someone pays for them like the Google model. You get some corporation to pay for the open, for the prototype, and then you open source it to anyone who wants it. It really is getting away from the whole idea of credits. Those of you who know Godard, uh, no, uh, of course, I'm, I'm interested in him. He lives in Switzerland in Roll. Godard says, it doesn't matter if you begin with an ethical ideal as an artist or architect, or if you begin with a formal ideal of aesthetics. In one way or the other, the two will meet. As you're working along that project, the two will meet. And you're going to have to figure out why you're doing it and how you're doing it. What's it looking like? And, but what makes a great work of architecture, a critical work of architecture, is when the two do collide and have a critical position. Um, 
here you see uh, the gym. Now I'll take you into another recent project. I see the future of cities to a little bit more urban project, a lot like this image that I took in Mexico City. So you have Pentecostal priests, you have street vendors, you have uh, protesting in the back, you have old infrastructure, and then you have this uh, pedal pushed uh, velo car, or, or you could have electric cars, because the whole center of cities would be um, uh, without combustion. Cars. So we went to Sao Paulo. We've been studying and researching Sao Paulo over time. And we have this concept we call 3D city or urban parangole. Uh, we have a little publication that just came out. And the idea basically means that we can't do master plans, but maybe we can do clusters. Maybe we can work on certain urban clusters. This is London, of course. This is the Spatial Agency Lab that came up with this uh, very important uh, kind of proof that the more intersections a city has, the more social life and activity it happens. So these are the little villages that London's based on, whether it be Chelsea or whether it be where, and you, will, and you know that that's where most of the life happens. So we went to Sao Paulo. We started to look at this particular area, voided downtown, where many abandoned buildings are. It has a ring road, uh, an inner ring road. And we said, OK, let's capture the subway stop, the train, um, uh, um, the train station, and the highway get off. And maybe we can do some interventions in some hubs. And we came up with this idea based on Elio Tisica, the Brazilian artist. Before anything else, it is necessary to clarify my interest for dance, for rhythm. In my particular case, it came from a vital necessity for disintellectualization. It was therefore an experience of greater vitality, indispensable, particularly in the demolition of preconceived ideas and stereotypification. So we also want to get away what a city is, and we want to think collective with new scales of mobility, re rethink how we navigate, um, and rethink the surfaces, what we call 3D city or syncretic city. So we, we look at these different hubs. We think that these hubs could be in, uh, in this is actually down, uh, Sao Paulo downtown. You could have a hub in all of these different areas. We look at the radius of the last mile. Basically, you know that from one subway stop to the other, you have basically about 400 to 600 meters. It's exactly the last mile that we have to look in that we actually can turn into uh, uh, very inventive, because that's where you have to carry your bags home. That's where, uh, in Mumbai, they built the, the new subway station uh, in Mumbai, uh, sorry, in, in, um, in Delhi. And Actually, they eliminated all the informal tuk-tuks and carts, and it's exactly those who uh, were needed to br help people and old ladies from the subway stop to their homes, right? So our idea is also this multi-tiered city where public spaces are brought up into the air, where, um, where we could look at these hubs. You actually can have vertical hubs in which you could, you could actually loan them out, or actually we could have a new zoning plan where you lease out certain air rights or spaces in between buildings, and you incentivate people to connect, to connect those buildings. And if you see there, um, here you see the, this multi, uh, these different layers of the city that we're trying to to connect. It's actually been thought about many times, and, um, and we're just trying to come up with a model of what that zoning pattern would be like. How we could incentivate, let's say, Doppelmayr Sky Lobby for a cable car to connect with Schindler, individual elevator towers that cluster buildings together and having sky lobbies and all kinds of activities in three dimensions. But not only that, um, also having the app tell us uh, where parties are, where public space and events on rooftops are, and how you could navigate that city. Um, and the mobility could be multi-tiered from tuk-tuks to electric cars to trains to trams. You would, have, you would now see the city in three dimensions, and you would work and navigate through it. And the model here are early attempts of the model. Um, but you can actually have the buildings light up 
with codes telling you what goes on so you don't have monofunctional buildings, but you have everything going on inside, but you would be able to read it with your app. Here you see our final model that tries to represent the situation of different layerings that go on and different zoning potentials and a little video that's very much like Archigram. Um, the global metropolis are in the process of linking up as hotspots, not as physically, not just physically with buildings, transport links and power lines, but virtually too, by means of radio, mobile phones, social, economic and cultural networks. For the first time in history, man doesn't have to live in a city to have an urban lifestyle. Indeed, one can no longer flee the urban environment as it's been transplanted into the pockets of suburbia and into your pockets with Serbia and even rural in rural lifetimes through your cell phone. This is why we, with our, uh, our UTT project, we say that Caracas is everywhere. Caracas already functioned on multiple uh, tiers and layers. And, and we see these three megatrends, urbanization, globalization, and informalization, have helped to, um, to blur the boundaries between what is the conventional planned city and the unplanned city, and to break those boundaries between islands and ghettos. Um, in most cases, cities in Latin America come about without the participation of architects. Um, and unfortunately, these islands and ghettos are two species that have become the focus of our research. So in this case, this little island um, it could actually function as pods and then link it to another island and another island, where there would be no combustion uh, cars allowed inside. So basically, these mappings that we do are kind of multi-overlapping, multi-layered systems um, that have the power to shape our perception of place, depending on how they're represented. And maybe now some of you want to know about Gran Horizonte in Venice. So I thought it would be only appropriate. We be, it began with a t-shirt idea um, of, a, of a sign in a restaurant in which we ate all the time in Caracas, uh, just next to the tower of Torre David, which you'll see in a second. So this is Torre David, the tall, uh, third tallest skyscraper in Latin America. Um, it was abandoned 17 years ago because it was product of a financial crash, but it became the metaphor for what's happened to Caracas in the last 20 years. Um, over time, it was 70% finished, and over time, glass was broken to get ventilation in. Um, and together for the Venice Biennale, Justin McQuirk, Hubert, and I, we uh, thought of uh, uh, Gordon Mata Clark. We are always interested in bridging art and architecture. Of course, maybe maybe some of you don't know. He had a restaurant in Soho called Comidas Criollas when there was no work in the 70s. He prepared here the fish, as you can see. He filmed. He took uh, portraits of artists there, um, and that was the place in which uh, all kinds of dishes. Here you see Mata's bones soup and all kinds of dishes were made. So, well, we thought, can we recreate a cafe? Maybe through food we can create common ground. We can bring people together to talk about the state of our cities, to talk about this um, gigantic uh, uh, skyscraper and failed project in Caracas. And it turned out that um, everyone enjoyed the, the food we invented here, the arepas with different fillings. Um, Justin and I working behind the kitchen, and it filled up and it became uh, 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 an incredible place this summer for us. The idea here was to bring the story of, of uh, this tower um, to the public and to say, well, maybe architects can do something, but we have to respect what's happening in cities. So the building actually has three, three, uh, three different uh, uh, volumes. The parking garage, a hotel, and the skyscraper. 
We began by making kind of a recreational story about how the building had been occupied, how police had raided it. Um, and here you have uh, Fernando, a resident of Torre David. He said, when we made the decision to occupy this space, it was because we really felt motivated by a process in which our country woke up. And when it did, we found several realities among them. This dead giant of 192 meters, dead in the middle of our capital city, dead with 45 floors uninhabited. When we arrived, the last floors of this tower, we stood on that heliport and we looked around. We realized that the whole population that had come to fill the landscape of Caracas, those who came from the Llanos, from Colombia, from wherever, we realized that all of these people were, were not here in the center, in the healthy, flat part of the city, but they were actually on the surrounding hills and with a higher level of risk. So we were told, go occupy those zones on the outskirts of the cities. And this, um, they actually protested. And they actually, that's why they squatted this building. And the building over time uh, has been occupied to the 20th floor. And the floors above, uh, 20 to about 24, 25, have been, uh, are occupied by tents, city. A model that allows for a mutual and ever-changing interaction between subject people and object architecture. Um, all kinds of transactions are being done. People, all the informal vendors, have their, their little carts inside and they go out into the city during the day. So in terms of judgment, and decision are thus inseparable from the crisis. Caracas is living a crisis. The world is living a crisis. So I'm not saying I'm endorsing squatting. I'm just saying we found it, but we have to accept that actually they put a better use to the building than anyone could have expected. In this sense, UTT has taken some decisions and have made some judgments on how to think about architecture. And we actually mapped the process of how they occupied. To engage in the critique of architecture means to situate oneself inside the crisis and embracing both hyper-awareness and loneliness. The loneliness of being, uh, of being thrown out of your own professional circles. The perception of crisis constitutes the starting point of criticism, we believe. On different floors, you'll find shops as, and that are interconnected, and you must be conscious that this means of diagnosing this crisis, exposing the judgment that separates the different principles that come together in a given historical situation of Caracas is not easy. We have incredible opposition and we have uh, uh, incredible left-wing movements that are quite radical. So we, were, we stood in the middle uh, putting this topic of the tower on the map, and it became a discussion in the last election one week before the recent election. It went on national TV. Here you see the, the, uh, the motorcycles bringing a lady up. She pays them $1 to go up those 10 floors and she can and bring merchandise. So somehow infrastructure, this human infrastructure, and then later they walk up and you also pay them to carry the goods up. The, maybe the infrastructure is actually what's bonding people together. The approach of contemporary architecture means taking on the question of difference and means of taking on plurality of expression, not only as a starting point, but as a multiplicity with, win, with which to situate any segment of this contemporary reality of Caracas. Here you see ladies uh, uh, having a whole production of clothing inside the tower. So the, the actually it's a hybrid building with productivity. The idea that architecture is a practical knowledge can should and should be understood within this framework of relationships and is not a diversion into remote problems. In fact, they could say they were actually getting involved with things that don't, are not for architects to get involved with, but economists, politicians. And I say that actually we are addressing our role as architects in this current crisis of housing. The, the, sky lo the lobby of the building has become a basketball court and they actually have tournaments with neighboring schools. So the hardware in this tower is the fixed structure, is the Le Corbusier framework, if you want, and is relatively boring and static, but generates a void, a kind of ready-made to be appropriated. On the 20th floor, you have a gymnasium with no, no railings. 
And we started to map all these things, and we thought, well, can we bring maybe some vertical circulation outside the tower? Um, we started to map how the floors were occupied. We started to map what was happening in different zones of the building where, where let's say, the, uh, certain productivities were happening. And here, most interesting, we, we mapped that the, there was a water tank on the 12th floor that was pumping to smaller tanks. And this was like a polder system because the Dutch polder system, the dike, you know, remember the famous saying that you have to put your finger in the dike, in the hole, right? And actually one member of society had to actually look over the dike that it didn't overflow. Well, in this case, there was a, there's a whole timetable of people uh, who have to take turns to pump the water in different hours of the day. So we said, can we create other micro systems of electricity? And we started to look into the facades to make very cheap facades for the building. And we realized that solar panels were good, but that was a little bit difficult in an urban setting. We brought out the elevators to connect in clusters. So now the elevator banks connect you to clusters, almost like community clusters with public spaces in between. And then on the top floor, we have the generation of about 30, 40% of electricity through aeolic uh, power because there's incredible good crosswind in Caracas from east to west. And that's all now mapped, fortunately, in our book that, that uh, just came out recently with Lars Muller publications, um, which will tell you the story. But if you think this is an anomaly, I take you to Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo has homeless right there, squatting now uh, next to City Hall. Here you see them more clearly. And has at least 1,000 squatted towers in the city of Sao Paulo. So I tell you that this is not an anomaly. Here you see a very nice uh, young lady waiting to get in the secret door into the squatted building. So if we could actually think about micro technologies of how to retrofit these towers, or uh, uh, we could actually do a lot of good. If I'm over time, just let me know, okay? So this is the project that Enrique thought was not built. It took us 10 years to build. This is actually a political statement, this red book. It got to the president and it was not us, we've never met him personally. It was given to him by the Austrian ambassador in Vienna at a conference of OPEC. And when he saw the potentials of using cable cars to retrofit the hills, he signed immediately uh, to Doppelmayr, only one of two cable car companies to do it. This was our early rendering of how we could introduce cable cars quite separate from the social functions underneath. Um, but we, it took us 10 years to move that through, to map the networks, to work with the community, to get kind of solidity, to map what was going on on the hill of San Agustin. Um, and so these mappings, as I said before, have the power to shape the, the, our perception. And these are our early drawings of the hillside community, the stairs. On average, people go up 39 floors. But how can they go up when it rains? And it rains six months out of the year. So we began first with some stair systems, um, uh, small little uh, adjustable stairs that could be built on stilts. Then we looked into um, doing a footpath. And we said, but the real challenge is the car-free city. So we brought to the, to the local mayor, we said, this is the project you want to do. You want to open roads, conventional urbanism. Um, but look at all the red houses have recently had upgrades, new floors added on. When you put this road system, you'll knock out about 30% of the houses. So if they were a political party that was talking about inclusion, they could not evict. Uh, do a slum clearance project. So we began to draw those, those ideas. We came up with cable car station with no elevators, all ramps. Uh, they were to be made a kit of parts. We, a model later was done. And here you see the five stations. So we connect right out of the metro. The metro is right here. You fly up into the, uh, to the slum, to the first station. You cross over to the second station, to the third station, and then back down to the metro line. So it's actually a loop with, with infrastructure, with the formal infrastructure of the city. This is actually the official now map, metro map. 
And here you see the five stations on the hillside community. 70,000 people live on this hill and had to walk down every day. But you can imagine for a mother giving birth, an old man who cannot walk, couldn't get down to service. There were people here who had never gone, been born up here and never gone down to the city. The cable car stations at the top. Here, what's incredible is after the station people, everyone is painting their houses. The whole, the whole community has changed radically. But the cable car stations do not want to be just a merry-go-round. They also need that uh, social infrastructure. So on the side of the cable car station now is being built this gymnasium and market and parking below, which on the rooftop has this field. And people, their lives have changed. Now in 10 minutes, they go down what normally took them two hours to do. So what is lacking in our opinion is a joint effort to link this top-down and bottom-up initiatives. In other words, municipal administration and general public must sit down together, draw up an agenda for the planning of our environment. Only then can we meet the basic needs of population in terms of energy, transport, infrastructure, construction, waste disposal, food, water, and social relationships. The cities on our planet need more than office tower blocks, museums, opera houses, airports, outstanding sporting uh, venues, they, uh, they actually need the glue that sticks together the fiber. We know that urbanization in the form of prestigious and signature buildings attracts investment and creates wealth. This is important, yes. However, this story often seems like an American or European fairy tale imposed upon other regions of the world where wealth does not flow but actually accumulates in bubbles. Cities in these developing regions witness marked increase in the income of a small segment of population. The majority remains, uh, sinks lower into poverty. So what I say is the majority world. So what was the worst part of the city actually has become the most interesting part of the city. It was shown in the MoMA show. Uh, now uh, Andres Lepic, who's now the director of the Munich uh, Architecture Museum, was the curator of the show. I think he did a very important thing. But as I said before, our idea is not to make a one-off. The cable car idea now has been exported to Rio. We came up with this project for Morro de Providencia to link the port to the main station. It's actually under execution at the moment um, with an architect, uh, uh, Asalias, who is actually the lead architect. And housing below is also part of that project. It still has not been attended. But maybe some of you know this vertical gymnasium. If I'm a little uh, over time, let me know, please. No, we're OK. OK, yeah. So this is the candidate. This is the candidate uh, Enrique uh, uh, Capriles, who was against Chavez in the recent election. We have been able successfully to build a cable car with, with the government in power. And we've also been able to build vertical gymnasiums with the opposition power. The point is, we don't want to align ourselves with anyone. It's getting a little sticky now. Um, the, the gymnasium is there on the corner, on the top corner. I'll show it to you here. It's under construction. As we speak, here you see it on the edge of the city, but it can actually form as a link between the informal and the formal. It wants to become a kit of parts. We open source it. So what it does is it takes a typical playing field that's underutilized. When it rains, of course, it becomes a bathtub. And it, and it becomes, and we bring a, a, it can be constructed in six months as the steel pieces are cut in, a, in, in, a, in an industrial nave and brought to site. And so it, you can actually build it over time. You can build one floor, and it wants to be exported to New York. We're trying to work now with the Clinton uh, Global Initiative to get it into, um, into uh, New York. So with that, I will just leave these visuals going, and um, I will just conclude. 
The collaboration I'm talking about is a win-win based on how sharing, creating a society with a community of value. Schumpeter, the economist, said the relevance lies in how structures and forms of production are created and destroyed. We work in a complex environment that calls for simple solutions. That means using available local materials and labor. Most people believe that low-cost construction must be inferior to expensive forms of building. We wish to overcome that prejudice of this kind, as well as outdated ideas of how a project should be developed. Only if we shift our expectations away from a product to a process-oriented design and reconsider traditional development strategies, we will, we will not be able to find an economically feasible solutions for the masses of people in slums. And only if we do that, we will have a vibrant city for every strata of society that lives in them. And phrased another way, we, can, we became poignantly aware that to operate in poor urban zones, we would have to overcome real limits in regard to land, money, and time. No one pays for this. And therefore, what I urge you all is to find a way amongst yourselves and to tackle the institutions that do have a lot of money, corporations, banks, um, and government institutions, and if you give them solid proposals that are grassroots and bottom-up intended, then you can really achieve a fantastic uh, product. And actually, you may not make much money, but you'll certainly be satisfied when you go to sleep at night. Thank you. Sí, sí, como no, está, está. So please, you have the chance now to really ask questions to the interesting lecture of Alfredo. So use your time for that. No questions, no volunteers. Yeah, yeah, of course, Matthias. You know that I'm not afraid of provocations. Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, I mean, how do you make sure you don't become voyeurist? Okay, very easy. You, let's say the place of our object of our early work was Caracas. So therefore, that was intimately related to, to my life, to my history. Every, right out of every house in Caracas, you have immediately next to you a neighborhood where your, uh, your nannies or your cooks or your gardeners work. In fact, they were our first extension of the think tank into the community. And, and it's a very Western European, let's say, notion to think of, of this kind of aid as voyeurism. The same thing that was, might be criticized maybe to, to Bono or to, or to Bob Geldorf with Live Aid. But I tell you, they made a huge difference for Africa, condoning half the debt of the African uh, 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 international debt uh, with their, their expertise. So yes, now I'm sitting very comfortably in a European institution at ETH, but but we've actually shifted our practice now from being on the ground, grassroots, to actually tackling the institutions like the IDB, like the Swiss National Fund, like, uh, um, like FIFA, like um, uh, uh, UN. So actually, we're going now in another phase of the development of urban think tank. However, to, to tackle it clearly, to not become a voyeur, you must work with locals. There's no way around creating very strong bonding uh, with locals. And I'll tell you, when you go to any slum, the ones that I know the best, of course, are in Caracas or Sao Paulo um, or Rio, people are waiting for some help. They have no way, they don't even know how to better their situation, and they are open arms to receive anyone who's willing to put some time and some help to connect them or to bring some prosperity. Um, what you might have more problems with is with the politicians. And it's the same, I, I like the question, it's a valid question of voyeurism. That's why I, early on I brought you the film Los Olvidados by Buñuel. High European 
a filmmaker, thinker from, from, uh, uh, from Barcelona, Catalan, no era, oh, no, era madrileño. Aragón, de Aragón, exacto, from Aragón. Um, he, was, he was the epitome of European art, art movies, right? Uh, uh, yet he made the most impressive, uh, impacting movie on the poverty uh, of, of Mexico at that moment. With straight face. In other words, if there's no manipulation, if there's transparency in your relationship, if the cards are all on the table, if your work is actually, uh, or your provocation, uh, like Buñuel's Los Olvidados, his provocation is absolutely sincere, um, then the voyeurism is not, is not a, an issue. Yes, I see another friend in that background. Um, no, what I was also already wondering also in Venice, and which I haven't really understood, I guess, uh, or I didn't really pay attention, I don't really know, whether you know, the, with the Torre de David, uh, there's actually a plan to implement the elevators and, you know, like the, the whatever, the improvisation of the water tanks, etc. Or is it just a research based work you could execute? Okay, so since, so all of the work at Urban Think Tank's done has had no direct client. We didn't get a phone call. Um, we kind of went out, we mapped things, we, reached, we used our teaching position. In fact, this is where teaching now can join with architecture, with our professional practice. We used for our teaching position to, to do research over time. We believe that the, that the first thing, we never enter into a job uh, with an immediate design, uh, let's say, uh, a time limit, very tight time limit, because uh, we believe that the research component is essential. So Torre David, like the vertical gym, like the cable car, were all research projects. It began as research projects. And now, I'm happy to say, after the Venice Biennale uh, uh, situation, it became a huge controversial topic. You can imagine the stacks of newspapers from all of Latin America and, and Venezuela on the topic, and it became a presidential debate item between the two candidates, and the present government, uh, w uh, although declaring that they were unaware of the project, um, uh, of the occupation, they have now decided to, to open a competition to uh, retrofit the building, of some proposals to what to do with the building. Um, so it's now becoming, turning into implementation stage. Yet we are continuing to work with the people inside because they're very worried about how that implementation would be not an eviction, but actually they want uh, actually to be retrofit inside. So we're working very closely, and it may take another 10 years. So if you guys are still around here in Berlin, maybe we'll show something in another 10 years of, of furthering that proposal. We don't leave things halfway. When we commit fully, and I think that's probably the best thing I can say is, is we've proved over time that commitment is your best asset. So easy to give up projects, to abandon them. Oh, but then if you're still a uh, go-on, huh? I can still have more words to say. <laughs> what do you think about those favelas in the next few years? Because now they make a huge step and to probably see something else which they've never seen before. All the young people, they probably see what they can do or what they can achieve. So what do you think in the next few years? I mean, the housing structure, everything will change? Or what, what I think they'll be about? completely incorporated into the city. Um, I think, uh, uh, curiously, they have a privileged position because they're on the hills. So they have incredible views, right? Um, so once they get the infrastructure, the proper uh, um, uh, transport and mobility infrastructure and sewage and electrical uh, infrastructure, then, then I think they'll be totally incorporated and there'll be incredible uh, places to live. However, because the Lefebvre, as you all know, uh, he wrote a seminal book uh, on the city, he uh, believed that the most powerful um, sense of community is when, when, when people build their urban space themselves. It's a little bit like Heidegger of the old idea of the cabin, the chopping the wood, that you come into contact with your very being. 
the notion of being, right? In that same way, uh, the follow-up to your question is if they were to become very um, good places to live, would that then be a gentrification and eviction, or some kind of, of process of, of, of gentrification? I tell you no, because people who have built their own house and have built their own urban space are not easy to let it go. So we know, uh, we made a little film called El Millonario, The Millionaire, uh, where there's a, a favela that overlooks the horse racing track in Caracas. So they have a parallel betting system on the favela to the, and they watch the horses with binoculars and they know which one wins, et cetera, and it's clear. And they have a bank, and they collect all, and they, they do the, the whole um, horse betting. And one guy won the bets, and they, he got paid. He became a millionaire. And we, <laughs> and we, we, we went to, to film him, and he was living in his house. And we asked, why didn't you move to some like, nice neighborhood? He says, I'll never leave this place. This is where my friends are and family. So, um, so it's a sense of community. It's very strange that nowadays, today, we don't even like to go up elevators with other people inside the elevators, right? It, it makes, makes for a very strange city. That's why we like this idea of a continuously looped city that's, that's a seamless loop between levels, what we call the 3D city, that somehow we can break that notion that we only extrude cities vertically out of a plan. And we got that idea because of the rolling, interesting, topographical uh, hillside communities. You might know that um, early 20th century city was, was basically um, uh, the small, let's say, the small house and the train infrastructure. The public and the private were quite separate. Then later, uh, um, middle 20th century, you got the little high rise, you got the more vertical apartment block, and the tram system got closer and stations and got connected. Well, we see the 21st century as actually this kind of interconnected bubbles of city on different levels between public and private spaces. Do you think um, in those communities there's something we lost already, which means working together, helping each other, so there's something special, and we will learn from it in the future, like from those favelas, for example, when they start doing, like, putting people together, interest group, and really move something? So yeah, I, I mean, society, I'll like give you an example. Very, I'll give you an example. In, there's one fantastic example in Vienna, just comes to my mind. It is the coffin factory. Maybe you guys know the housing block that was, that was built inside a courtyard. Um, it, was, it was actually a, a community group that got together, pooled their money together, and they built inside an old block of Vienna, in this co what was the old coffin factory, they built, um, they built these housing blocks that work in a very communal way with a communal restaurant, with a communal laundry service, with, with uh, all kinds of sustainable uh, technology. It was done about, uh, B by BK2, no? BK3. 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 Uh. So um, I find that there are European examples of people pulling together their resources, finding lots that no one wants, right? And, and, and making, building that city. It's going to be up to you, the next generation, to start to do that. But we have to leave our comfortable position where we think it's all sitting at a desk and designing at a computer. It's really about going on the ground and command. Now, the one thing, it's not excusable is you have to leave this university with an incredible talent in visualizing projects. Because the only advantage you will have to be able to carry these ideas forward is if you can explain your ideas visually to someone else. Because that's the edge you'll have. You won't be a better economist. You won't be a better engineer. You won't, you know, but you should be the one who can explain visually your ideas. Or complex systems, explain them clearly and visually. For which project? Uh, the, your presentation or at all? I mean, is that like something that I, I mean, because it's very recognizable, you know, in your, in, in your, in your presentation that it's like a multimedia or entertaining form, you know? Is it, but is it something you can also criticize for? 
I'm sure there's people that criticize us. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I think architecture has to be more fun. Come on, guys. Coop Himmenblau was blowing the sides of mountains out with dynamite. Um, you know, architecture must burn. What happened to the great ideas of the 60s and 70s? You realize that the Smithsons were going down to Morocco, testing out ideas down there with, with Candace. What happened to, to architecture? In the 80s and the 90s, we lost it, man. We, 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 we separated ourselves. We separated ourselves from the very interesting parts of architecture, of getting our foots on grounds of hybrid, of, of cultural hybrids, et cetera, and, and I really, and of blurring boundaries. But why? Because when the 70s came in, the oil crisis cut off all of those architects. And Margaret Thatcher cut off council housing. You saw Rem's exhibit in, in Venice, right? Council housing died, which was an institution of architects who were producing public housing. It happened, it died in the United States also. There was the New York Housing Association. It died in the 70s also. Why uh, private wealth, free market ideology uh, killed all of this type of work. And I tell you, we just have to pick up on those references from the 60s. We've got new tools today, and that's a powerful combination. Thank you.